Welcome to History Happy Hour, a special series from History Uncovered. It's the end of February 2024, and we've handpicked a few of our favorite history stories from this month. Today, we'll be talking about how Amelia Earhart's missing plane may have been found in the Pacific Ocean, the discovery of a warrior's grave in Hungary with intact armor and his horse, how archaeologists in London unearthed the city's first fully intact Roman funerary bed, the recovery of the so-called Titanic of the Alps shipwreck in Switzerland, and the historical mystery behind another shipwreck discovered in Lake Superior. As well as a number of historical anniversaries from February, including the launch of Facebook, the arrival of the Beatles in New York City, and the foundation of the NAACP. I'm all this interesting staff writer Austin Harvey. And I'm all this interesting staff writer Kalina Fraga. And welcome to History Happy Hour. That's where we'll start, as we always do, with our news stories. A little caveat with this first one. It's technically from the end of January, but it was after we recorded the last episode. So, yeah, I mean, it's a big story. We were hardly the only people talking about this one. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of big news publications picked this up. But yeah, the potential discovery of Amelia Earhart's long lost plane, allegedly, you know, if we are to believe this is what it is. Kind of exciting. Very exciting. This was an expedition started by a group called Deep Sea Vision. They're based out of Charleston, South Carolina. It totally independent, not like backed by any big university or anything like that. Just a group of enthusiasts who went out and did like a sonar scan in the Pacific Ocean. And they found something at a depth of like 16,400 feet. Wow. Oof. That kind of looks like an airplane. If you look at the sonar scan, I, I don't have you looked at this at all. I did look at the scans. Yeah, that's so deep. I think that's deeper than the Titanic, which I think is twelve. It is very feet. deep. Yeah, it looks like a plane. It looks vaguely like a plane. Yeah, the sonar scans are really interesting. What I thought was interesting about this was I reached out to a couple different people because we. Uh, started some new news procedures at work. Yeah, I talked to uh, Richard Gillespie, Mm -hmm. uh, the founder and the executive director of the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, who is also very interested in finding Amelia Earhart's plane. Deep Sea Vision seems very confident that that is what they found. Gillespie is less confident in it. In fact, so not confident that he told me it cannot possibly (laughs) be Earhart's plane. Yeah, it's pretty definitive. Yeah. His reasoning was interesting, though. He said the reason is because the image shows an airplane with swept back wings Mm -hmm. and her plane had straight wings. And due to the structure of the aircraft, it was physically impossible for the wings to fold back like that, even in the event of a crash. And he said it looks more like a mid 1950s aircraft carrier based jet fighter, many of which were lost in accidents. Hmm. So it is a a plane, it seems. Yeah. But he does think it is a plane. He just thinks it's uh, like, yeah, a jet fighter plane, not something that she would have flown, which I understand to a degree. Not, look, he's the expert, not me. Mm-hmm. But if it were Amelia Earhart's plane, it's been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for almost, almost a century, a century right? at yeah. this point. Yeah. Who's to say that it didn't break in a way that the wings folded back now? But until they dig it up, I guess, or not dig it up, until they recover it, if that yeah, ever happens. Yeah, sounds like that'd be pretty no way difficult. Really, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how deep we can get right. <laughs> into the ocean and make it back out. That would actually be a pretty good um, podcast to talk about, if we haven't done it already, Amelia Earhart and her disappearance. Because there's so many interesting theories about was she like eaten by crabs? Eaten was by she crabs. straight on an island? Was she captured by the Japanese? Like, there's all these... Interesting. Yeah. And some of the, and there's like weird evidence, like maybe there was a radio message. There were things like skin cream bottles found on the island where she disappeared. So, oh, well, yeah. That like would be an interesting thing to talk about for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those crabs are big. Yeah. They are big. Those are big crabs. <laughs> I talked about that on a podcast I do with a friend of mine. We talked about Amelia Earhart's disappearance. We lumped, we were talking about a bunch of conspiracy theories. We lumped together 11 that we didn't think were even plausible, and that was one of them. Oh, the crab one? Yeah, but my mind changed when I saw the crabs because they're big. Uh, yeah. I want to be like weakened, maybe like injured, and yeah. Yeah, right. It's right. possible. They are omnivores. So. Oh, so it's possible. They're big crabs. It's Why not? They are big crabs, the snow crabs or coconut crabs, coconut crabs. Uh, yeah. Snow crabs are the ones that you can just get at like a buffet. Yeah. The coconut crabs are massive. Mm, crabs are so good. They're like the size of a we actually have an entire post on them. Oh, if you go to Google Images, you type <laughs> coconut crabs in we're the second image. Nice. The picture shows it as big as a trash can. It's huge. Ugh. Coconut crabs sound like they'd be delicious. Like <laughs> they would taste like oh, yeah. hints of coconut, which I, I, you I know they wouldn't. Them. But you, I mean, yeah, but you could cook them in like coconut oil. Mm. 
Sounds great. I'm hungry. The next one it is a unique find. This warrior that was discovered in Hungary. Um, he's an Avar warrior, which was a band of like Eurasian nomads back in the day. He was buried in the seventh century, and what's kind of remarkable about his remains is that he was buried in layers, and the first layer was his horse, and the second layer was this armor called uh, the Mahler armor, which is made of all these plates stitched together. And they found this armor before in other graves and stuff, but very rarely a complete set like this is. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So it's the Mahler, horse. like M-A-U-L-E-R. It's L-A-M-E-L-L-A-R. Yeah. Oh, okay. The Mahler. Yeah. Oh, Le Mahler. Le Mahler. Yeah. I think it said Mahler. I was like, oh, was that his like role in the army? Like <laughs> mauled people? <laughs> the Mahler. The Mahler. Got Le Mahler. Got yeah. It. Yeah. So it was a horse, armor, him. And then he had a wooden quiver, arrows, a bow, and his sword. So all this kind of wow. interesting stuff right in wow. one in one grave. Yeah. Yeah. And all fully intact and like. Yeah. The armor was kind of the big part of the story because it's, yeah. it's just rare to find that. Yeah. That's very cool. So the horse was on top. They found the horse first. It was kind of like all. I think it was all taken out of the ground like together but yeah it was the horse mm. and then like in the okay. layers okay. Yeah. i wasn't sure if the horse was when you said first layer if that if you meant like bottom layer or top oh i see yeah yeah the, the top, top layer. layer yeah got it yeah it's quite interesting yeah uh speaking of things buried in the ground people yes. buried in the ground <laughs> yeah archaeologists uh they found the first fully intact roman funerary funerary bed hmm. in london which is kind of cool as well because they have a um like a reconstruction of what the funerary bed would have looked like. And it the way it's drawn, it kind of looks like an Ikea bed. Almost. Oh, yeah. I was like in parts. Like it's, it's, I was like, what do they mean funerary bed? It's literally a bed. It has like wooden slats that go across. It has legs and like it's a bed. But it's a bed that they would have carried a dead person on. Hmm. And then this one was actually like not just buried whole. They found the entirety of the bed, but it was like disassembled before oh. it was buried. Huh. So like it really was like an Ikea find like they could pull it out, put it back together. Very interesting. But these were used to carry people to their graves to their generally. Graves. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. And then buried alongside it. Huh. Seems like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Experts said it was possible the deceased was carried to the site on the bed and then it was dismantled and buried alongside his remains. Specialist from the Museum of London Archaeology told me this is the only time they've ever found a complete set of a Roman funerary bed. Wow. But they don't know the full significance of it yet either. So, yeah, they know that the person might have been carried, then it was buried along them. This expert, Michael Marshall, told me it might have been a possession of the man or his family, perhaps used during his life, or it might have been specially commissioned. But right now it's kind of up in the air. Huh. Wow. Fascinating. It sounds like that like objects like these, like wooden objects are really rare to find because they usually sort of disintegrate right. over time. Yeah. It's 2000 yeah. years old. So, yeah. And it, it's also just a really good example of just how much care and like skill was put into these wooden yeah. craft work. Right. Shows just kind of like a really good example of the time and like how much they cared about respecting the dead, respecting the deceased. Yeah, the reason it lasted this long, too, is because it was buried close to the river fleet and the soil mm. was damp. So the oh, dampness interesting. preserved the wood. Wow. Gosh, it's just incredible how much stuff is buried underneath the earth in London. We've done a lot of stories about like mosaics and all this wild yeah. Roman stuff. Yeah, I mean, there was like a whole other London below London at one point. And it's yeah. fascinating to find examples of that something that doesn't really happen often in america right or ever really in america well, i wonder if london does um like underground tours you know like some yeah. I, Se seattle actually does do that because the city was there was like a horror i'm trying to remember why there is a whole underground it's something to do with like there was a fire and i don't hmm. know i should know this better because i'm from there but you can go <laughs> underground and like kind of walk around and see oh, that's very cool before the city was like kind of built up yeah i know paris is really big for that too because of all the catacombs oh sure yeah yeah I've never actually seen the cat. I've gone and waited in line at the catacombs like three times, but I never waited long enough to <laughs> go bail? see the You were just like, ah, yeah. this isn't worth well, it. Well, it's like you're in Paris for like a couple of days and waiting in line for right. a few hours. It's other stuff you can do and see. So Yeah. Like when you go to like Universal or Disney World for like a day and you're like, oh, God. Yeah. God, I've got a lot to fit in today. I don't have time. Right. Yeah. Well, Disneyland at least has like Fast Pass and whatever, but um, right, yeah, there's no the Paris, Paris Catacombs, Catacombs Fast Pass. <laughs> they should have that, but they don't. Missed opportunity. <laughs> 
So we're going into the shipwreck section of this episode, I guess. <laughs> yeah, two different shipwrecks here. Yeah, the first one, they're both kind of strange stories in that in different ways they were sort of like purposefully sank. Y- yeah. It's a bit of yeah. a stretch for the second one, perhaps. But yeah, the first one, at least, it was the ship that had been a ferry boat for 40 years. And then it was sort of just like a money pit. So they decided to sink it in the middle of Lake Constance. Wow. So wasteful. I know. but Well, actually, it's it's wasteful, but the locals came and like took the doors and like benches and stuff and brought it home for firewood. And some oh, of the doors fun. are like still in their basements. So I guess they picked it clean. Yeah. Oh, all right. Fair enough. But they sank the ship and it was called the Titanic of the Alps because it has like a three cylinder engine, steam engine like mm, the Titanic mm. has. And when it sank, when they sank it, it went like stern up just like the Titanic did. So people were like, oh, wow. oh it's like the Titanic. Huh. I mean, that would have been cool to see. There's photos, lots of photos online yeah. of it sinking. I mean, like to watch it in person though. Oh, yeah. Like to get in motion and everything. Yeah, it would have been kind of neat. We covered it because they're going to bring it up from the depths. They decided. Oh. Yeah. Huh. How long has it been since they sank it? 90 years. About. Wow. Sunk in 1933. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. It's in really good shape still. You can still see its name on the side and everything. It was called the Santis. But now, basically what they're going to do is put these, like, giant balloons underwater and inflate them and, like, raise the ship to a certain level and then do that again and then raise it one more time. Huh. Yeah. Very cool. I thought that part was pretty neat. Yeah, that's an interesting way to bring that up. I guess it's maybe more gentle than tying ropes to something or... Well, it's probably more cost efficient, too. I don't know. a bunch of balloons on there. These giant balloons, like underwater balloons. I don't know. Uh, But anyway, that's kind of going on. It sounds like it'll be in March and April, and then they're hoping to put it in a museum somewhere. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. They could turn it into a museum. Yeah. Use that as the infrastructure. That'd be really neat. That would be cool. Yeah. I feel like I've gone to museums that are like on like military ships before. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't one of the Titanic museums do that? Isn't it like laid out kind of like the Titanic? Maybe. Like or is that Belfast? just me being like hopeful and thinking that would be cool? I think there's like museums... Maybe not like down to every D. De- oh, well, the one in Tennessee actually I think is pretty, but I don't know if it's like the whole ship and not just like sections of the ship, like quarters right. and stuff. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, not the whole ship, but yeah. Some of them do have like recreations, like big recreations of it. That's cool. I, uh, yeah, the one in Tennessee does look, it's a big ship. Yeah, that one's really legit. Yeah, that's for very some reason. Cool. <laughs> right. I don't know why it's there, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> Yeah, it's not like the Titanic ever went to Tennessee. Right. Speaking of doomed ships, uh, yeah, this one, uh, we had another story about the SS Arlington, which is not a boat that really anyone had ever heard of before because it wasn't like a big deal. Mm -hmm. It was a World War II era merchant ship, just a very run of the mill ship that was a it was transporting wheat. So it wasn't really anything miraculous or like a big deal like the Titanic was. But the story of it is so interesting, or rather the story of how it sank. They found the remains of it in Lake Superior, which is very mm-hmm. exciting. It was uh, discovered by this kind of like amateur shipwreck researcher. His name is Dan Fountain. He was studying the area and then he came across what he thought was like a blip, basically, that said like, hey, there might be something here. He took that independent research to the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society. And then together they discovered this 244 foot bulk carrier, the SS Arlington. And then as they, you know, they uncovered it, they were like, yeah, this is a very exciting discovery. More people started to become aware of the story behind it, which Hmm. is super weird. It was April 30th, 1940. The Arlington left Port Arthur in Ontario and it was heading for Owen Sound, Ontario. So it wasn't going super far. It was just going across the lake. It was helmed or headed, commanded by Captain Frederick Tady Bug Burke. <laughs> huh. He'd crossed the lake many times before. It was very, very foggy at the time, but nothing out of the ordinary. Another large freighter, the Collingwood, also set off at the same time. And then as night fell, that fog became very dense, heavy storms. And the Arlington started to take on water. Hmm. Uh, the first mate, Junus Maxi, ordered the crew to bring the ship closer to the shore where it'd be safer from the wind and the waves wouldn't be as intense. And then Captain Burke demanded that the ship remain on its original course rather than going into safer waters. Hmm. Weird. Right. It's strange. Uh, I don't know what the thought process is there. So then around 4.30 in the morning, it just started sinking. Hmm. 
unsurprisingly. Right. Uh, Chief Engineer Fred Gilbert sounded the alarm and Captain Burke just didn't give any orders. Was he like an older guy? Do you know how old he I was? Don't, I don't know how old he was. Huh. I'm assuming he was a little bit older. He was like an experienced captain. But yeah, with no orders or anything to follow and very afraid they were going to die, the entire crew of the Arlington abandoned ship and managed to make it on board the Collingwood because hmm. it was sailing very close by. Everyone except Captain Burke, who... Weird. Decided chose to, stay. to go down with the ship. Captains do that sometimes. Captains do that sometimes. And then apparently some members of the crew who were then on the Collingwood said they saw Captain Burke waving to them as he went down with the ship. And they don't know if that was waving goodbye or if that was waving for help. Hmm. But he died with the ship that day. Wow. And no one really knows why. Sounds like he had some sort of like psychotic break or something. I don't know. Yeah. It feels very like death wish y. Yeah. The more horror minded among us might think it was like a Lovecraftian oh. break of sanity mm-hmm. sacrifice the ship kind of situation. I guess they didn't find his body in the ship, did they? When they I don't believe so. Hmm. Wow. They have photos of the shipwreck. I, there's no body in any of those, at least. Wow. That's very strange. Yeah. But they were saying that they hope that maybe finding the shipwreck could provide some closure for his descendants. I guess some closure. I think I, I was a yeah. lot of questions about what happened. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was like, yeah, maybe a, a little. I mean, you know where the shipwreck is. That's something. Although, you know, like, I feel like maybe I write about true crime too much, but the crew set, like, told this story, but maybe something else right. happened and they killed him right. and then they bailed maybe that's possible I don't know. too i don't know it's possible just throwing that out there there's no way to know for sure yeah yeah dead men tell no tales dead men tell no tales exactly <laughs> those are the news articles for february that have come out or the, some of the top ones for february we wrote a lot more than that yeah to all that's site. all we wrote that's all we did <laughs> and we're about to write like even more because we're getting another news writer yeah another news writer joining us so we're about to start pumping out news at twice the rate yeah so much news so little time so now we're moving on to our as we always do to our historic anniversaries for february Although I wanted to flag that it's also our anniversary of this show, of the History Happy Hour, which we started in February 2023. So it's been a year. We didn't do it every month, but almost every month uh, since then. And it's been cool. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, it's a nice change of pace. Yeah, it's neat. It's a a bit more of a loose format than the regular episodes. So For sure. And it seems like people like it. I could be wrong, but it seems like people people listen. The numbers show that people like it. People do listen to it. That's true. People do listen to it, so... Yeah. 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 So it's been cool. It's been kind of a fun experiment the last year. I've enjoyed it myself. So I pitched the name History Happy Hour as a joke, but our <laughs> boss liked it. We were like, so, let's do it. <laughs> we were like, I was uh, cool. Fine by me. I believe I was promised we would have more like alcohol during History Happy Hour, which we haven't really done so much. No. No. It's kind of early. No. It's, only, it's not even 4 p.m. So yeah. Maybe we should do a later recording one day. Maybe start at like 4 30. 4 Yeah. Yeah. We'll be down. Carry us through to the end of the shift. Mm hmm. That's right. In any case, we'll move on with our historic anniversaries for February, starting with a pretty sad one, which is the death of Philip Seymour Hoffman, the actor. Yeah, that's crazy. That's been 10 years already. Yeah, he was fantastic. He was only 46 when he died. He had had a lot of problems with alcohol and drugs, and there were drugs found at the scene. Drugs were found in his body. And yeah, that was his cause of death. Acute mixed drug intoxication. Yeah, he was just excellent. Like, I, I actually saw the play Doubt last night, which was a movie oh, nice. he was in yeah. in 2008, which I thought was fantastic. And yeah, yeah he was just the best. Yeah, very good in uh, Capote as yeah. well, the Truman Capote movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was great. It was really, very tragic. The next story is sort of tragic, but sort of just strange. And that's the anniversary of the Patty Hearst kidnapping in 1974, 50th anniversary. She was the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, the media mogul. And she was kidnapped by this like small leftist guerrilla group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, Hmm. which never really did very much. It was never more than like a dozen people, but this was kind of the big thing that they did. And the weird part, I mean, it was was a huge story at the time because she'd been kidnapped and they were asking for a ransom from her family, which actually her immediate family wasn't, didn't have the same money that her like grandfather had had. 
But then she started participating in some of their heists and was releasing these tapes and calling herself Comrade Tanya and carrying a gun. And like, you know, so it was it was like, what happened? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did they like indoctrinate her or was it just a setup from the beginning that she was involved in? Yeah. Stockholm Syndrome or what was going on? Right. The Symbionese Liberation Army. I'd never actually heard of them before. Yeah. they. I mean, again, they didn't really leave much of a mark. She was arrested finally in September 1975, found guilty, put in prison for, I think, like seven years. And then eventually her sentence was commuted by Carter, and then she's given a full pardon by Clinton. To this day, there's still like kind of what happened. And she says that she was, you know, abused by her captors and kind of had no choice mentally except to accept what was going on. But no one really knows except for her. Yeah, it's a very strange, unusual atypical very very story. strange yeah not often does somebody become kidnapped and then borderline terrorist yeah right although we yeah. did talk about it feels like a million years ago about the original like stockholm syndrome and how people yeah. they it was people being held hostage by bank robbers if i recall right and they yeah. began they to really sympathize with their they sympathize with them but they didn't then become bank robbers no no that's yeah true. that's like right yeah so yeah that's a very very weird story Patty Hearst. Yeah. Less weird, more uh, diving into a different realm here, but another big event. February 4th marks the 20th anniversary of the launch of Facebook. Wow. Which is crazy to think. 20 years. Yeah. 2004. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I was in high school in like 2006, I think I got a Facebook 2007. Yeah, when I didn't get my Facebook till maybe 2009, 2010. My yeah. mom was really averse to me getting Facebook. She thought like someone was going to catfish me or something. Yeah. I, think. <laughs> I was like, Mom, I'm just talking to like the five people I talked to at school. I don't think my parents knew what it was exactly. It was just kind of like everyone had one. And it was so yeah. innocent. When it first started, like, you know, sometimes I go through my old emails to try to find photos and stuff. And I used to get emails for every Facebook message or someone around my wall and stuff like, you know, like meet me meet, meet in the cafeteria for lunch or like, yeah, what do you think about this newspaper article? Crazy what we would just post publicly. Yeah, like, it was just like you go to somebody else's wall and you're like, hey, how are you? It's like, why is this a public message? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it's changed a lot since then. Right. That was pre Cambridge Analytica controversy. All yeah. sorts <laughs> of stuff has gone on. I mean, it's been a, a wild ride for Facebook. It has more than two billion users today, which is a lot more than it used to. And yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's started off with just a small it was just for harvard it was just for harvard Harvard yeah it was like just for harvard and then just for like boston schools and ivy league schools and then just like colleges and that's what i remember is like it was just colleges and it was a big deal when as a high schooler i could get a facebook did you ever see the social network a long time ago yeah like when it came out what a good movie yeah, it's, it's interesting how young and old it is. Like 20 years is not a long time. And yet Facebook has sort of dominated the conversation in a lot of ways. Every now and then I, I think Facebook's irrelevant. And then I open Facebook and I still see people like regularly posting on it. Hmm. And I'm like, interesting. Yeah, I don't have a Facebook anymore. But yeah, I don't know the last time I posted on it. I like never. Yeah. I don't know. Social media in general is sort of an, you know, it's something we use a lot at work, obviously, to spread our articles and everything. um, But it changed society. And I think it'll be interesting to see in 100 years what people think about this time. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, it's still an evolving landscape. Definitely. Of like Twitter came out two years after Facebook. I don't know when Instagram came out, but then that got bought by Facebook. Mm -hmm. Then Elon Musk bought Twitter and that's a whole thing. That's a whole thing. Well, now there's TikTok too. And there's all these other like kind of like startup apps like Be Real was a thing for like a hot second. Maybe it still is. I don't know. Yeah. Snapchat. Snapchat. I still use Snapchat, but just with my family. (laughs) Yeah. I use it with like two people. Yeah. And yeah, it's different, different world. Yeah. Yeah. Funny to think two years ago or sorry, 20 years ago. No one would have ever thought being a social media influencer was a viable career option. Right. Yeah. And now that's like what everyone wants to be. It seems like I have to say, I'm really grateful that I did not have Facebook or Instagram the way it is today when I was in high school. Yeah, same. Same. That would have been I think a whole thing. Yeah, I'm always interested in like the studies on how that impacts a person's like self-perception and mental health and whatnot. I've definitely pulled back in recent years. Ever since I started like trying to take care of my mental health, I was like, mm-hmm. this is a thing I don't want to invest in. 
I yeah, I quit Facebook quite a long time ago. And I remember feeling like worried about that and then really happy. And I yeah. found that the people who like actually matter stay in touch. Like it's all these people yeah. whose lives I yeah. don't care about anymore that I don't need to see their, you know, yeah. babies and whatever. Or just stuff that makes you angry. Like when I stopped when I deleted my Twitter account after the Musk takeover, mm -hmm. I was like, what am I missing out on? Do I really miss scrolling through this feed of like stuff that makes me angry and porn? <laughs> yeah. Because that's what it has become. And I was like, no, I'm better without this. Right. Yeah. I I, I still like clung on to my Twitter accounts. I'm like, maybe as like a writer, I'll need it. But probably not. Yeah. Anyway, that was a long tangent about social media. But <laughs> <laughs> we have some feelings about it. We got clearly. some feelings. Yeah, well, we also have feelings about this next we anniversary, do. which we discovered. Thankfully, we're on the same page. about. Yeah. <laughs> February 7th, 1964, or rather February 7th, 2024, marks the 60th anniversary of the Beatles arriving in New York City. It's so cool. Huge, huge. Enormous. Event. Yeah. Beatlemania hits the U.S. Um, I was kind of looking around some get some info about this. And yeah, it's like a week before they'd had their first number one hit in the US. I want to hold your hand. I don't think they thought that they weren't really sure how they were going to be greeted in the States, but they arrived right. and like thousands of people were at JFK to greet them. Oh, the girls were going crazy. crazy. Yeah. And then, of course, they appeared on Ed Sullivan and 40 percent of the US watched that show, which is That's incredible. Crazy. So wild. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you saw this, but I think I think it's uh, Sam Mendes is about to do four Beatles films, unique films following mm. each of them, but they're going to like overlap in some way. I did hear about this. In and then I saw somebody, some fan casting of Jacob Elordi as Paul McCartney. Oh, interesting. And I was like, it'd be really weird. He's too tall. <laughs> it, I was gonna, That's exactly what I was going to say. I was like, it'd be really weird if you had four dudes of normal or three dudes of normal height playing the other Beatles and then Paul McCartney is just inexplicably yeah. tall. There's just an article in New York Magazine that I only, I only skimmed because I only I don't really know who he is, but it was, it was like, is Jacob Elordi like too tall? He's 6'5" which is like pretty tall. It's pretty tall. I, yeah, I've seen, I've seen some like some casting stuff about like who would be good for the roles and everything. And I, I think yeah. it's a cool idea. I'd love to see that. It sounds like they're excited about someone doing a good job with their story. They all approved it. So yeah, their states yeah. approved it. Yeah, no, I would love to see a Beatles movie. I was a huge Beatles fan. I told you when we were talking about this the other day because I, I know a couple Beatles haters and it blows my mind. Yeah. You don't have to listen to their music every day. You don't have to love them, but you got to respect just how pioneering they were as musicians right when i was in seventh grade we had to do this project where we presented the life of somebody important from history but we had to dress up as that person mm. and kind of tell it like it was like a like autobiographical and i chose john lennon oh nice because i was such a beatles fan no yeah. that was before i knew he, he was not the best guy he had but, some <laughs> some stuff going on some issues yeah but uh I know I always have loved the Beatles that my first band was named after a four chords from a Beatles song. I think that's really cool. I love the Beatles. I think they're just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting as individuals and then like together and this idea that like two people like John Lennon and Paul McCartney, who had really different styles and mindsets and everything, when in the same room could create these oh, yeah. amazing songs. Everyone's a genius in the whole band. So yeah. in songs that still like other than production value sound modern. Mm hmm. Like the way the the structure of the song and the melodies and things like that. One thing I always thought was really interesting, the, like a Beatles fact that I learned, the reason their songs are so catchy is because they didn't, when they were starting out at least, didn't know how to read or write music. Yeah. So they had to come up with melodies they could remember. Right. And they couldn't record them, right? It wasn't easy to like open your phone and be like record. So it had to be something exactly. that they could. Yeah. Yeah. So that love, love <laughs> me do. Like it's like, yeah, it's it's an earworm. It's catchy. It's by nature. Yeah. Yeah. I talked about this with you a little bit on Slack, but like the post post Beatles stuff is also really interesting. It was so messy how they broke up and then they all went in these different directions but produced pretty incredible stuff. Yeah. Did, did you ever there's a um I don't I don't know if you call it like a conspiracy theory or like just like a paranormal story, but there's this this story about a guy who allegedly has a Beatles recording from an alternate dimension where they didn't break up oh wow huh i i'm totally i'm probably like butchering this but like the the story goes that he has this recording of the beatles if they had never broken up and you can listen to it it's online and obviously people have come in and been like no this is bs mm -hmm. and if you listen to it you can hear elements of their solo work like um i think there's like part of like band on the run oh, is uh -huh. like weaved into this 
alleged alternate dimension recording. Um, and people are like, obviously, you just stitched all of these songs together to make it sound like one song, mm -hmm. one Beatles song. And then this guy's explanation was, well, no, of course, you know, they still had the same ideas. So those ideas would have worked themselves into this recording if they had stayed together. Hmm. It's a very like, you know, uh, it's a bit of a stretch of a defense <laughs> against it. Well, but fascinating story. It's kind of interesting because a couple of months ago, they resurrected that John Lennon song and the yes. Beatles even they even brought in like some of George's old sound and like added mm -hmm. it with AI. They were able to kind of stitch it all together. And yeah. it was it was weird to see that. And Paul has always been so into technology. I'm speaking like I know him, but he was like, this is so good. Why, why wouldn't we use like AI stuff to yeah. do this? And and it was it was cool. It was the same uh, technology Peter Jackson used. I think Peter Jackson was involved in this. Yeah. Somehow. Clean yeah. up their old footage and stuff. And yeah. Uh, did you listen to the song? Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty good. I did, I too. Liked yeah, I liked it yeah. as well. And I, I loved the get back documentary that peter jackson did oh the get back documentary is very good yeah it was neat yeah no that song was really good it was kind of haunting it was a little eerie yeah just knowing because what one because it's kind of warbly because of the recording quality but two like hearing john lennon sing again on a new track right yeah after he's been dead for so many years like it was like whoa that's weird yeah i i don't go to the upper west side that much anymore but i used to go up there quite a bit and um walking past the dakota where he was shot it's still like it's weird it's yeah. eerie it's always people kind of like hanging around and looking at it and everything but yeah very sad Our next anniversary is the formation of the NWACP, which yeah. was formed in 1909, February 12th. And uh, it kind of came about after this, like, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this organization should exist, but it came about in particular because yeah. of like a horrible race riot in Springfield, Illinois. And then there was kind of like a call to action. All these people signed up to support an organization. People like W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, et cetera. Yeah. A lot, lot of big names that you lot recognize from yeah. other black history things. And it grew quickly. I mean, in 1917, it had 9,000 members. Today, it has half a million members. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It is the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the U.S. today. Our final anniversary then is the... The St. Valentine's Day Massacre, February 14th, 1929, when a bunch of guys, seven men associated with George Bugs Morin, were shot and killed in Chicago. It's thought to be orchestrated by Al Capone, who was Morin's rival, though he was in Florida at the time. And it was never definitively linked to him. But yeah, very convenient. It is thought that he he did that to Morin's men. And there's some pretty uh, gruesome photos of that on our site, yeah. on our post about this massacre. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a like a really pivotal moment in the Chicago gang, gang wars. Yeah. War. yeah. Well, so violent. And there, there'd been yeah. like clashes between them before, but then, yeah, this was. Right. And so interesting as I've been writing more of just in general for the website about gangsters, I never was like a, I've seen the Godfather, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like I, I never cared for like the mob stuff maybe because i'm not italian american thought the movies were good but i've naturally just been learning more about it it's crazy how long this went on for hmm. like we're talking like pre-bootlegging this stuff started this mid 1910s blew up with bootlegging in the 20s allowed these guys to amass massive amounts of wealth and power yeah and some of the like families were still operating like the late 80s right yeah like I that's an entire century, basically, of these guys operating underground, people being aware of them mm -hmm. and their influence, and then just somehow never having enough evidence to actually take them down. Mind blowing. Right. I think we talked about this last time for why I can't remember why this came up during Jack the Ripper, but that like Al Capone was finally like nab for taxes, like nothing else. It was, right, wasn't like right. the violence, he murder or anything. It was it was it was taxes. So, yeah. I mean, granted, easier to cover your tracks back then. But yeah, like, that's true. St yeah. Still just mind blowing to think about how long that went on for. Mm -hmm. And then how it was like immortalized in many films. Right. And TV shows. And TV shows. And kind of glorified sometimes as well. Maybe not so much by the movies themselves, but like fans of them. Mm -hmm. Like you ever meet somebody who's like really into The Godfather? <laughs> I can't say that I have. <laughs> and you're just like, you're just like... Mm, this is a little concerning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was a big Sopranos fan in that big. I yeah. watched the show and enjoyed right. it. But I just wrote something about the Sopranos the other day. Nice. So did I. Yeah. We've been doing some Sopranos content lately. 
That's fine. Great show. Great show. Great show. That's our also our cocktail. Yes. Brings us into the cocktail, the uh, cocktail South hour. Side cocktail. Brought to us by Drunkard's Almanac. Not sponsored, just that's that's who posted this recipe. What a pretty cocktail. It's green. It is. It is very green. It's like a, almost looks like pistachio, like green. You know what I mean? Yeah, very nice, light, pale green there. It's like a sprig of, or a little mint leaf on the top. Yep, the recipe is one and a half ounces of gin, three quarter ounce of fresh lime juice, a half ounce of simple syrup, or if you want it a little bit sweeter, you can make that 0.75 ounces, and seven mint leaves. Wow, that's a lot of mint leaves. A lot of mint leaves. So it's just a minty gin drink, which uh, sounds pretty good to me, honestly. It's so, I guess that's the lime juice that makes it so green then. I, yeah, it's got to be. Hmm. Unless, do you like puree the mint leaves or like crush them up or anything? You muddle them. Uh, that could do it too, the muddling. I guess so. In the picture, it just looks like so green, but, and it looks almost like frothy. It's almost like an egg white cocktail almost. Yeah. In that picture, at least, that we have. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, the recipe just says to toss everything into a, well, it says take all but one mint leaf. Put it in the palm of your hand and give it a good spank with your other oh, hand. Wow. That's a, for my time bartending, that is a thing that often you smack it and it kind of like. Mint leaves? Oh, yeah, it like awakens the mint. It like helps the mintiness <laughs> come off. <laughs> wow. It's like massaging kale kind of, but like less, uh, less yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's kind of, you <laughs> smack the mint and then throw it in. But yeah, you just do that, toss it into a cocktail shaker, add the liquid ingredients. You can also start with. The simple syrup and muddle the leaves. You don't have to shake it up until it's frosty cold. And then they say to double strain it into mm -hmm. a cocktail glass just to make sure you're not getting any leaf fragments from the mint floating around. And then Makes you put sense. that last mint leaf on top as a garnish. Wow, fun. I might make one of these tonight. That sounds really good. That does sound good. Yeah, very classy. I like mint. I like gin. I actually, there's this local brand of gin in PA that has kind of a minty flavor, hmm. like just as it is, so. Nice. Well, Al Capone apparently enjoy this drink, so if you want to raise a glass to old Scarface Al tonight. Al Capone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that kind of wraps up the usual part of the episode. I guess the last thing we wanted to talk about, we've been getting, it's been quite a cool the last couple of weeks, been getting lots of or more emails and voicemails yeah, as, as yeah. we've been kind of pushing that a bit more during the show, which has been awesome. So yeah, we got a we got a great email from a listener named Steve, and he said some nice things about listening to the episodes. Uh, he says his favorite episode was the 1904 Olympics, which was Me too. your favorite Me episode. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I also liked that episode. That was a really fun one from yeah. back in the day. Steve yeah. also, yeah, Steve shared some ideas with us as well, some that might potentially become episodes in the future. They were actually like pretty cool and cool to hear what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. Kind of gives us a little bit of like guidance in terms of like where we should be focusing as well. Yeah, I mean, because the podcast is so such a, you know, a, we could focus on almost anything with we have a broad uh right right all that's interesting like broad variety of topics we yeah. About. yeah yeah we it's so. definitely and it's fun to like figure out what to do next but it, it is cool to hear what people are interested in hearing yeah yeah he also yeah. asked to give a shout out to his wife and son so shout out yeah. to, to liz and cooper <laughs> <laughs> that's the yeah. first request we got for that and that's fun yeah, that's fun i yeah i liked it in a little shout out yeah yeah so thanks thanks for your email steve and I guess we can just kind of segue into anyone else who wants to email can. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, the email address is podcast at allisinteresting.com, which is one option. You can also leave a voicemail by calling us at 929-526-3029. Yeah. Yeah, we've gotten yeah, we've gotten some voicemails recently. We got that nice email from Steve, a couple other emails recently. Um people, you know, informing us of things we were not aware of yeah but jack the ripper especially yeah i was gonna say especially jack the ripper so yeah it's been really cool to hear from people and if you want to hear more from us or rather read more from us about any of the stuff we talked about today any of these news stories uh you can go over to all this interesting.com where we are constantly putting out new content on uh history things new to science is what new developments in <laughs> science <laughs> true crime stories stuff about the paranormal folklore kind of, yeah just a wide variety of stuff everything bound to be yeah bound to be something interesting there for you uh you can also join our newsletter there at all that's interesting.com slash sign up yes yeah that's it <laughs> yep and uh become a member at all that's interesting.com slash membership membership yeah 
I was just looking at our our calendar. Um, next week is our final Jack the Ripper episode. Yes, we'll be talking about theories on the Ripper's identity uh-huh. and other a couple things. of other things. Yeah. yeah, focusing more on the killer uh, himself or their self rather. Right. Whereas we've talked about you know all of the victims up to this point. So yeah, some theories about him, also kind of the situation, what was going on in Whitechapel um, in 1888. After that, we're kind of back to our normally scheduled programming of standalone episodes. So the next one looks like right now is the Osage Murders podcast. Ah, yes. The uh, inspiration for Killers of the Flower Moon. Correct. And then Mary Magdalene. So that's in the pipeline at the moment. Yeah, I feel like I keep saying pipeline <laughs> on the did. show. Yeah, <laughs> first, when I see this, I said that I was like, I've said that definitely before. Every, I think every, every time. Every time. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so we've got some exciting stuff coming. And then, as we said, always new stuff on the website. Every single day. Yeah. Every yeah. single day. Every single day. We work hard. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us and our freelancers and, uh, of course, all of our editors. Yeah. Yeah. Big shout out. Big shout Big out to the editors. Out. But yeah, stay tuned for more, more from us. If you feel so inclined, leave us a rating. It really helps, mm. you know, spread the show. It helps more people become aware of it. If you have friends that you want to get, you know, you want them to be a little smarter, maybe recommend the show to them. Be like, hey, go learn some stuff. <laughs> want to be smarter? Guaranteed. Um, and check us out online. We talked a lot about social today and we're all over yeah. social. We are on Instagram at History Uncovered Podcast. We are on TikTok at Real History Uncovered. You can find us on Facebook as well at uh, not at, you know, just face it's history revealed. It's history revealed on Facebook. There's no ats on Facebook. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. We're everywhere. So check us out. Send us an email. We love to hear from people. And we'll be back with Jack the Ripper in a week. Yeah. And until then, stay frosty. Stay frosty. Oh.